the earth, he left the trained people who would carry on in his absence the beginning of the New Testament church. And we're thankful for the work that they have done and those who through the succeeding centuries have also done. And we're thankful, Heavenly Father, that we have the opportunity to carry on the work today. And we pray your blessings on us. Please help us to accomplish the mission that we've been sent. Please forgive us where we've fallen short. May it be your will to remember our sins against us no more. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Now. Chapter 4, 1 Kings. Do you have any comments before we begin with Chapter 4? Something that we had? Okay. Nobody. Uh, verse 1. Now King Solomon was king over all Israel. These were his officials. Azariah, the son of Zadok, was the priest. Elihorab and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, were secretaries. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was the recorder. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the army. And Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the deputies. And Zabad, the son of Nathan, a priest, was the king's friend, and Ahishur was over the household, and Ador, excuse me, Adoniram, the son of Abda, was over the men subject to forced labor. Now, the commentaries said that Ahishur, who was over the household, they seemed to think another word could be used instead of household, and it would be uh, maybe a more modern term, he was over the harem, the, basically the, it says household, but it was really the women. He was in charge of all of that. Now, um, it mentions in the, in the translation I have, which is the New American Standard, forced labor. Uh, some other translations may have a different, did you have something, Tom? Did you raise your hand? Okay, I thought you raised your hand, sorry. Uh, Yeah, and I, I, we get into that with uh, Hiram when they yeah. were they done. Yeah, he, it was an orderly way to do it. So maybe we'll see that. If anyone is interested, and we may get into it, but in case we don't, some of, some of what we're going to read tonight, especially later in Chapter 4 and into Chapter 5, we'll be dealing with getting the, the materials together with Hiram, uh, King of Tyre. And, and to Sidonians as well um, for the temple, okay? And what Tom's talking about, it tells us each place, you know, whether it's this in First Kings or it's in Second Chronicles, I think it's chapter two, chapter one and chapter two, um, deals with some of the same things. Not everything's identical, but it, it shows you that they had an organized way of doing it. I think it was like three months, if I remember. One month to work, and then you go home and you rest for a couple of months. And so, does that seem what you what you were thinking? Okay. Uh, so, uh, now the forced labor, I, you know, that's the term they use. Was it basically slaves? I mean, you know, it wasn't like they worked them to death. They did get some rest, or was it people who, you know, were like. We see sometimes people out along the road picking up trash and uh, things like that, you know, that they've been in jail. Was it, I don't, I don't know. I can't, they just say that they were forced labor. That's the term they use there. So. Anything? Okay, so verse 7. Solomon had 12 deputies over all Israel who provided for the king and his household. Each man had to provide for a month in the year. So these are the men there, it says deputies. So they're over there in charge over certain groups of people. And you can imagine, well, within a year, they are gonna be responsible for the food for that particular month. And so um, 
it's just another orderly way to try to handle all these things. But it wasn't like one guy had to do all this. He had people underneath him to accomplish these tasks. Uh, verse 8, these are their names. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim. Ben-Decker of, of Machaz and Shealbim and Beth Shemesh and Elon Beth Hanan. So the name there is Ben Decker, Ben meaning son of Decker in uh, Machaz. And so, so there's a place, that's one place. Then Shealbim and Beth Shemesh, meaning house of the sun, okay, and Elon Beth Hanan. So there's four places they mention. Then in verse 10, we see Ben Hesed, so son of Hesed in Araboth. Sukkah was his and all the land of Hefer. So it's, it's like identifying these individuals who were over certain areas there. Then Ben Abinadab in all the height of Dor. Tephath, the daughter of Solomon, was his wife. Uh, Beanna, the son of Ahilad, in Teanach and Megiddo, and all Bethshin, which is beside Zarethan, below Jezreel. And that makes sense because Megiddo, which is along a road that follows along, is near the edge of Jezreel. It overlooks the Jezreel Valley there, where it would be good for raising things like grain and that sort of thing. So continuing in verse 12, from Beth Sheehan to Abel Mehola, as far as the other side of Jachmeam. Uh, ben Geb Geber in Ramoth Gilead, the towns of Jer, the son of Manasseh, which are in Gilead, were his. The region of Argob, which is in Bashan, 60 great cities with walls and bronze bars were his. Now, um, we, we don't see a lot of description here, but in another place in the Old Testament, we see God referring to some of the people, especially the women of Bashan, he calls them the kine, K-I-N-E, meaning cattle, of Bashan. So it's not a very direct, it's a, not a complimentary term, uh, which at that time, those were, I guess you would call them heathens. They were, uh, people did not believe in the true God. And so God was referring to the kine or the cattle of Bashan as these women. Uh, now, there's another one we're going to see in just a little bit. Uh, going to talk when we get further down about Og. That'll be in the verse 19, Og and Sihon, king of the Amorites. So this is a kind of establishing where all of these people had control, and it shows how big, to some extent, how big Solomon's influence was, just like we saw with David uh, several weeks ago when we talked about it. So... Um, any comments before we go on? Okay, so verse 14. Ahinadab, the son of Idu, in Mahanaim. Now, <clears throat> it's, it's probably more like Mahanaim is the way it probably should be spoken, that, according to Smith's. The name Mahanaim was given that name. It means two camps. So if you were to go back into Genesis and read about Jacob, or if you want to call him Israel, he and his brother had been separated for quite a few years. They were no longer, at least up to a certain point in time, um, there was bad blood between them. They separated. Now they're going to come back together. And Jacob doesn't know what to expect. You know, he's, he doesn't know because, you know, Esau had threatened him. <clears throat> and so it was at this place, it says it's called the meaning, according to Smith's, is two camps. Well, Jacob divided those who were with him into two camps. He didn't want to lose everything if his brother's upset. 
because they both have people working for them. And so he divides it into two, and that's where it gets its name, two camps. It's like, so as it turns out, things worked out well in that meeting anyway. But, but this is where that location is. That was where he divided them. So that's where the name comes from. Now, uh, 15, Ahimaaz in Naphtali, he also married Basemeth, the daughter of Solomon, Beanna the son of Hushai in, in Asher and Baloth, and uh, Jehoshaphat the son of Perua in Issachar, Shimei the son of Elah in uh, Benjamin, Geber the son of Uri in the land of Gilead, the country of Sion the king of the Amorites and of Og king of Bashan, and he was the only deputy who was in the land. So I think the reference to Sihon and, and Og are only to try to give people an idea of well-known people from the past that would have been in this area where Geber was, uh, was in charge of. So, um, now, if you remember, the thing about Og that was so important was that he had an iron bedstead. Okay. So, or if you want to say the framework was made out of iron. Iron was not that plentiful at the time, something that the uh, Israelites were not able to work at that time. That's when they were coming into the land. Um, so he's trying to locate where all of this is at. Any comments before we go on? Okay, uh, verse 20. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. They were eating and drinking and rejoicing. Now Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. So when it says the river, it's talking about the Euphrates River. Don't, now sometime you may see um, a re reference to the river of Egypt, not meaning the Nile River, but another place that's along the, the sea coast as you would head down uh, out of Israel, there's a place where it sometimes has water in it and it's just a place that they would locate as a kind of a, a landmark and they call it the river of Egypt. Well, it's on, its, on the way to Egypt, but it wasn't like the Nile River. It's, it's not that if you ever see that. So it's talking about from the Euphrates River, which is a long ways from Israel. And it's talking about everything in between there where they were coming to Solomon and uh, paying tribute to him. A lot of them were. So uh, verse 22, Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour and 60 cores of meal. Okay, now I have a footnote here. One core, K-O-R, equals approximately 10 bushels. So Solomon's provision for one day was 30 times 10 bushels. Now that's not, he's not gonna eat all that, but he has people that eat at his table, his household, people that are coming and going, some of them on a regular basis. So that's just, um, uh, that was fine flour and 60 cores of meal. So that's a lot. 10 fat oxen, 20 pasture fed oxen, 100 sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fattened fowl. For he had dominion over everything west of the river, Euphrates, and Tifsa, even to Gaza. And near Gaza is where they're the river of Egypt would be. It's in that vicinity there. Over all the kings west of the river, Euphrates, and uh, he had peace on all sides around him, around about him. So Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba. So remember, we're talking top to bottom, Beersheba being the lower uh, limit of Israel itself, and Dan being the the city furthest north. All the days of Solomon. Okay, any comments? Jerry? Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, <laughs> well, we're, um, we are going to, uh, I trans, I have some numbers, but it's only about the numbers of food items, not the people themselves. Um, but it's a good question. I mean, th this is what we're, some of the commentators get into this, um, In business, you, you you look at it like who's producing. Okay, the, you have ways to measure who's who's really accomplishing the work and how efficient are they. And you're always looking for ways to improve that. Okay. And what you see is, a, you know, I mean, you expect the king. Well, he's going to be fed and clothed, and his family probably, you know. It's, and it's like so. The more people that get at the king's table uh, doesn't mean that they never do anything but it's not like they're not working like ordinary people and so it's like yeah you're going to get more and more people as as they become more prosperous here you get more and more people that are kind of on the dole you know that, uh, but I don't have a number for you uh, it does talk about horsemen and chariots down here and uh, but it does talk about the people so I wish I could tell you <laughs> But that is, it's, it's household count. Yeah. Just as household, right? Just immediate. It had to have four or five hundred people there. The, it seems like, yeah, there's, I mean, well, if, if, if you're, if, if you're including in his household, it's not just his kids and his wives. There are other people that, and all that yeah. yeah, that's, that's right. Because some of those people are accomplishing something, but it's not like a guy that's out in the field. So you had I, some, I just want to say, don't forget how many wives he had. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that in a little while. Yeah. It's. Um, so what's the difference between fat and oxen and <laughs> oxen from the cows? Uh, well, I, I think, um, like we do today, I mean, I don't raise any well, life. Well, uh, some of, like the ones that are in the field are probably working too, you know, that so if you're working, you're probably going to be leaner than if you're being fattened for consumption, you know what I mean? Because people do that. I mean, it's like we see that a lot of times. They'll feed them corn. But like you said, free range or grass-fed beef, which they claim is much better. I, but that, that's the way I took it was that some of them are actually working, but I, I don't, I mean, that's a lot of oxen. Usually they raise them in a pair, right? I think that's the way they, because they work together. You usually have two of them work together, and that's, they try to raise them up together. Uh, I, Dean used to, used to uh, plow with horses, I think. But, well, he's, I don't think he can hear me, but it's, but he used to plow with horses, and it'd be, he'd, there'd be a team of two that he would use. So he's done that. Yeah. Yeah. It was near uh, Crooked Run, right? It was kind of around, was around the corner. There. Off the, off the road here, which I thought it was Crooked Run. I don't know if you Well, it's, it wasn't far from Crooked Run. Yeah. It was, <laughs> New Moose Road is what it's called. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, yeah. That was that the one that goes up over Red Hill? Yeah, yeah. Where she's well, where she's talking about is a little bit further out Crooked Run. Not far, but I don't know. Where the little white schoolhouse is. Yeah, but that's not the one she's talking about. The, there's a, if the one she's talking about, if you you go, you you can end up on 39, but past Red Hill. If, isn't that right? Yeah. It's out toward uh, what's the what's the Winery. yeah the. Yeah, that's the name. Breitenbach. Breitenbach, yeah. That's a name from Germany, I think. He took that name. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's where her grandfather was. Her, her grandfather and my grandmother on my dad's side were brother and sister. They're siblings, right? So. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha, 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, you're thinking of, you're thinking of the clan farm. That's also on Crooked Run. <laughs> the old clan farm uh, is still there. It's got bricks where the entrance are, it's, and there there's a cross made out of bricks. It's the way they put the bricks in, as you can see. But if you don't pay attention, you would never. They stripped up behind that what a year or two ago, a couple of years ago, I think. Because, uh, but anyway. Um, did that, did that answer what you wanted? I, I just consider all, all these people that are truly part of the household, but then there are other people that eat at his table, like, uh, I'm trying to think of his name now, the, the old man who said, well, I don't want to be there because he helped David, but if you want to help my son, you can do that. So I think Solomon kept him at the table for as long as he lived, you know. It's, but, it, I mean, you're guaranteed food as long as you don't mess up, you know. It's... Uh, don't, don't uh, follow anything up with a king. So that's the way it's like the, I mean, it's a huge number of, so you, you got to believe that when the harvest time came, that they probably didn't have a bunch of, you know, a lot of drought at this time. But if they did, then you're looking at some real problems. Uh, so anyway, anything further? Okay. Now, um, so let's see, 26. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Uh, the, those deputies provided for King Solomon all who came to King Solomon's table, each in his month. They left nothing lacking. So, so these... These are included with people who are providing for the, the king's provisions. So what we saw earlier is, is what it takes. So you get 40,000 so I mean, you gotta feed these animals too. So now there has been, and whenever you see these numbers, there's always somebody that challenges the numbers. Are they accurate? How accurate are they? It isn't that, did he have horses? Did he? It's like, well, when they translate some of these things, maybe the numbers aren't exactly right. Uh, it's, but it just shows there's a lot. He's got a lot of stuff here. That's the, that's the intent. Uh, I mean, we don't have, I don't have anything other than, if you go to back to Second Chronicles chapter two, you will see some numbers that may be a little bit different. Uh, but it's the idea that he has a prosper, for a people who, not that many years before, we're just sheep herders, and some of, and in a, you know, people dispute this, but in a slave situation down in Egypt, now they've, they've got a thriving, prosperous country here. Took a while. Doesn't mean there was no problems, but it's the idea that they've come a long way and they're prospering now. So uh, this is a pinnacle and it's only the third king that they've had, so. Anything else? Okay, so, um, verse 28. They also brought barley and straw for the horses and swift steeds to the place uh, where it should be, each according to his charge. Now God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind like the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, Heman, Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. Now, um, we know that we don't have all of that. S they speculate that some of these things were probably lost, perhaps during the time of the Babylonian captivity or, some, or something like that. So, but we don't have all of these today, but this is what it's saying he, he created in his lifetime. <clears throat> 
And uh, when he, in his writings, it says in verse 33, he spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He spoke also of animals and birds and creeping things and fish. Men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon and all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. So, so now we get into chapter 5. We're going to talk about Hiram, king of Tyre. So just to remind you, uh, I think most of you already know this, but whenever you see Tyre, often you'll see also mentions Sidon. There are two locations, two cities, if you will, that are along the seashore of the Mediterranean, but further up than Israel. Um, Tyre was actually an island, but not very far off of the shore, the coast, uh, because a few hundred years later than what we're reading about now, um, when Alexander the Great was making his move to the east. Um, Tyre basically told him, you can't touch us. Ha ha, we're out on this island. You can't get here. Ha ha. So he did, he built what they called a mole, which is basically, he built a road out there. It took a while, but he went out there and beat them. And, but uh, initially it was basically offshore, not a long ways, but some. And then Sidon is on the shore, so and often you'll see their names mentioned together. So Hiram is king of Tyre, and we know that David had talked with him at, at one time. And uh, so he sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend of David. Then Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, you know that David, my father, was a, unable to build a house for the name of the Lord, his God, because of the wars which surrounded him until the Lord put them under his, the soles of his feet. But now the Lord, my God, has given me rest on every side. There is neither an adversary nor misfortune. Behold, I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord, my God, as the Lord spoke to David, my father, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he will build the house for my name. Now, therefore, command that they cut for me cedars from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants. And I will give you wages for your servants according to all that you say, for you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. So, so you see Tyre and Sidon. Now you see the name Lebanon mentioned. So the cedars of Lebanon, and there's a a medical facility that uses that that name, Cedars of Lebanon. Uh, but um, sometimes you'll hear Cedars Sinai also mentioned as a, a place in this country that treats people medically. Uh, when Hiram heard the words of Solomon, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord today who has given to David a wise son over this great people. So Hiram sent word to Solomon saying, I have heard the message which you have sent me. I will do what you desire concerning the cedar and cypress timber. Now, in the King James, it doesn't say cypress. It does say cedar, but uh, it says, I think, fir in F-I-R in the King James. Uh, now, doesn't matter whether you say cedar or you say cypress or fir. They are different trees, but they're all evergreens. Now, when I was a young fella, I remember my mother had a cedar chest. And that was important. Um, they used to talk about women when they're going to get married. You, you want to, they call it a hope chest. Okay, But even, I mean, after you're married, some things you wanted to keep in there because wasn't it moths? They don't like cedar. So over time, it kind of wears off so you can buy cedar chips or something that's artificial, but it has the same effect on moths. They don't like that. So, uh, so my mother's was not real pretty, but she loved that chest and that had, that's where she kept all of her, her best things were in there. Uh, so I still have the one my wife had that was 
Maybe some of you have something like that. I, I assume you've already heard that. But even cypress is considered an evergreen. They're all evergreens. Uh, they d there are, though, different... Um, they fit into different categories. It's the simplest way to say it. But it's still evergreen. Some say it uh, could be even a, a juniper. So, any comments? Okay, so, talking about cedar and cypress. So these timbers were big. Um, my servants, in verse 9, will bring them down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will make them into rafts to go by sea to the place where you direct me, and I will have them broken up there, and you shall carry them away. I think when he says broken up, it's like he's talking about rafts. So it sounds like instead of putting them on a boat, Put them in the water, we'll lash them together, and we'll bring them down, then we'll take them apart. I think so. What, what he means there when he says break them up. Um, so, anyway, whatever the case, they are going to have to work these. And, and, you know, Solomon has already said, well, you guys know how to do this better than anybody. Kind of a little flattery there, but it's the idea they do know how to work this wood. So, um, so he's going to break them up and he's going to take it wherever you want. Then you shall accomplish my desire by giving food to my household. So when Solomon said, I'll give you wages, he wants those wages in the form of food. And we're going to see some of this in the next uh, beginning of verse 11. So Hiram gave Solomon as much as he desired of the cedar and cypress timber. Solomon gave, then gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20 cores of beaten oil Thus Solomon would give Hiram, not just one time, year by year. So he, this is a continuous thing. So, um, so Hiram, he's you know, assuming that Solomon's able, doesn't have a drought. A, he's able to accomplish what he wants. I mean, Hiram's got guaranteed food coming in for quite some time here. So, but it's a way of paying for it. Any comments? Sir? Okay, 12. The Lord gave wisdom to Solomon just as he promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a covenant. Okay, <clears throat> now, this is what Tom was talking about earlier. We're going to get into beginning in verse 13. Now, King Solomon levied forced laborers from all Israel, and forced laborers numbered 30,000 men, and he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in relays. They were in Lebanon a month and two months at home. And Adoniram was over the forced laborers. Now Solomon had 70,000 transporters and 80,000 hewers of stone in the mountains. So that this is where he's getting, not timber, but he's getting the stone that they're going to use. Besides Solomon's uh, 3,300 chief deputies, who were over the project and who ruled over the people who were doing the work. Then the king commanded and they quarried great stones, costly stones, to lay the foundation of the house with cut stones. So Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the Gebelites cut them and prepared the timbers and the stones to build the house. Okay. I, for the for the stone, I don't know. Now, Lebanon isn't that, I mean, it isn't, you know, it is a long ways off, but it is it is over toward the seacoast and up the seacoast. Um, and that's why they, to transport it, it's simple to just put it in the water, float it down. That's how um, the Egyptians did a lot of things. When you see some of the, on the Giza Plateau, um, they believe that the river, the Nile River, was much closer than it is today at that time. In fact, that whole area was a complex that they had things coming and going all the time, sort of like a harbor. Um, and, but the Nile River no longer is that close to, to the Giza Plateau. Uh, it's the same idea, though. You, if you can, you use the water to accomplish the big, heavy work as much as you can. So, um, there's a lot of traffic of these men going through that area. Yeah. 
It would be. Um, it's. I mean, it's. You, know, you work a month. It doesn't say how many days a month. Now we know that in Egypt, in Egypt, it varied depending who on who was in charge at the time. That is, who was Pharaoh. Um, they have a community. I have on a videotape. It's not videotape. It's a DVD. I have both. I have tape and DVD. Same same thing in two different forms. That is a village that the people who worked on some of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings, this was like on the other side of the valley. It's where the workers were at. And they call it the City of Truth. <laughs> but they had dwelling places there. And basically you worked, you got food, there were other things. And uh, they have this recorded. So they, uh, although I didn't see it, but they described uh, generally speaking, a work week could be as much as 10 days. Then you would get a certain number of days off. It might have been two, three days. Um, but you were always getting a lot of people. One of the you know, things they liked was beer. And the Egyptians, since they had all this grain that was available, they were good at making beer, and people would get that. It was really a liquid form of food. Um, in addition to just having wheat itself, you could, you could uh, prepare it. And they just seemed to like that sort of thing. So there were some benefits to it, but you, you know, you were still. In some instances, they they hired people. Some instances, they didn't. They were forced labor. That that's in Egypt. So, but that's I don't I don't have any actual numbers. No. So. Um, It's, uh, the bell's getting ready to ring here just a, in a little bit. So let's, let's leave chapter 6 for next week. And since I mentioned Second Chronicles, let's go back to Second Chronicles. We're going to run out of time, but we're only going to cover some of the same things. And you can, if you're interested, you can look at these on your own, at your own time. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, even before chapter 2 of Second Chronicles, at the end of... Chapter 1, it's Solomon's wealth. He amassed chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. He stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. Now, the ch chariot cities, um, well, anyway, 15, the king made silver and gold as plentiful in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedars as plentiful as sycamores in the lowlands. Uh, Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Tu. The, the king's traders procured them from Tu for a price. They imported chariots from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver apiece and horses for 150 apiece. And by the same means, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of, of Aram. So... They want horses for themselves, but also they're willing to sell them. So they've got a trade going on, which is important. As you can see even back in those days, there's a lot of trade going on. So um, now Solomon decided to build a house for the name of the Lord and a royal palace for himself. So Solomon assigned, and it starts going through 70,000 men to carry loads, 80,000 to quarry stone. So we've seen some of these numbers already in what we just read earlier. And then Solomon sent word to Hiram, and they don't spell Hiram, it's, it says Hurem, H-U-R-A-M, uh, king of Tyre, it goes through that. Um, so you can see here, uh, however, there are a few things different in uh, chapter two of Second Chronicles, um, verse seven. Thou send me skilled man, a skilled man to work in gold, silver, brass, and iron, and in purple, crimson, and violet fabrics, and who knows how to make engravings, to work with the skilled man whom I have in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David my father provided. So he's gone on about, you know, I need people. They're basically going to work with them, but they're going to train them so they can do this themselves, working on this. So it's like it's a, it's a common sense kind of way of doing this thing. You guys help us get this, and then 
we can carry it on ourselves and if we want to pay you we can do that too send me also cedar cypress and algum timber from lebanon for i know that your servants know how to cut timber of lebanon and indeed my servants will work with your servants to prepare the timber in abundance for me for the house which i am about to build will be great and wonderful now behold i will give to your servants the woodsmen who cut the timbers 20,000 cores of crushed wheat and 20,000 cores of barley and 20,000 baths of wine and 20,000 baths of oil. So uh, now I don't have, an, uh, maybe one of you does. What is a bath? I don't know. Uh, but we do know what a core is. It's about a bushel. So, um, but I don't know what a uh, bath is in case. I, I should look in Smith's. They may have something in there. Okay, well, that's a lot. 150,000. <laughs> Was it, you mean for the, for the 20,000 bath? Oh, one bath is, wow. Better have a lot, <laughs> but that's if it's fine. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I think the bell's about ready to ring here. So. Lord willing, next time we'll look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 6. Still a lot in the <laughs> okay. You must have a good Bible. It's got good reference in there.
Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study and worship service. We're glad that you are able to assemble here, heat or no heat. Hopefully you have power restored and hopefully we are past some of that for a quite some time. If you might be visiting with us, would you please fill out a visitor's card and leave that with us as you leave the building this evening. In our announcements, you can see to my right that our brother Dick McCoy has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Planning on moving him to hospice, please keep him, Sandy, and their family in your prayers. Tina Shaw remains hospitalized in Altman and is on a ventilator, but she is improving. My wife Linda is expected to continue her rehab to get stronger. Uh, she had a doctor's appointment today for the past surgery, and he's pleased with that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, if you do go for a visit, short please, nine minutes, 59 seconds would be pretty good, or cards or calls. Uh, please be aware that uh, New Dawn had uh, two patients and one staff member with COVID. Uh, they're not closed or anything like that, but just want to let you know ahead of time, you have to wear a face mask and a shield, get your temperature taken, and fill out the information at the kiosk. So like I said, just wanted to tell you that. And uh, Linda was, I guess you would say, somewhat quarantined because she's a new patient. Not that she has anything, but they've tested her a million times at the hospital and two million times over there. So I uh, just, as I said, just wanted to let you know about that. But she is improving and we appreciate all and every bit of help that you've given uh, to our family. Janet and Ron, as you well know, still have ailments and physical problems and medications and procedures and this sort of thing, so keep them in your prayers. Have I missed anybody as far as the sick list that is not here or that I've mentioned so far? We, we want to make sure and you know, include everybody. If not, June 25th at 1, excuse me, at 10 a.m. will be Secret Sister Reveal Brunch in a fellowship hall. Sign up sheet in the hall if you can come. But if you can't come and would like to participate next year, please uh, take care of signing up for that. Postcards on the counter to hand out for VBS, which is June 26th through the 29th. I would like to encourage you, if you haven't already done so, see Brother Jason and get your name on the, for lack of a better word, all call. A message will be sent to you on your cell phone if there's some problem. Uh, we did have a problem that probably 99% of you did not know. Uh, Chris and I talked and uh, his information was in, that the south side was out of power, that our building was out of power, and it might even be up through Saturday. I don't know where that came from, but at any rate that uh, we were gonna be without power for a while. So we called, Chris, we, we called Jason and said, uh, get us an all call. I called Caleb just to make sure. He said, nope, we have electricity. So we assumed that the building did. So Sammy ran uh, 100 yards as fast as she possibly could and said, with the baby. With the baby. <laughs> Did the baby run? I'd like to see that. But at any rate, everything was fine over here. So we got a hold of Jason and he was ready to do the button in 10 seconds. <laughs> so it all worked. So what I'm saying to you, it would have saved you a trip to the building if you were signed up for it and we did have to do that. And it would be a long way from Baltic and Tim had to get his dozer out to get out of his driveway from the storm a couple nights ago. So uh, again, seriously, if you haven't signed up, please do, Jason will guide you through that and help you uh, if you have a cell phone. Two announcements about church camp. Senior week, July 3rd, registration is open. You can register and pay via the camp's website or by mail, and as we said before, if money is the issue, it isn't an issue. Please uh, talk to the elders and we will be more than welcome to help and take care of that so that you can go to camp and that's the most important thing. So please, if that's a problem, let us know. Saturday is the final camp cleanup day. Help with light painting, weed whacking, cleaning, and so forth is needed. Uh, see Noreen for more information. And one more camp information. Attention, first and second graders and parents. Camp day, first and second graders, Sunday, July 17th from 2 to 8 p.m. Registration is free. Come visit the camp, and the address is on here, and I'm sure there's several folks who can tell you if you need directions. Have I missed anything that needs to be brought to our attention at this time? Rob will have our songs. 
Anthony, opening prayer. Caleb, the lesson. Pete Peremba, closing. If you would please join our services. Thank you. First song this evening, we have an anchor. Three verses to the song, and following the, following the song, be led in prayer. <clears throat> Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move firm and deep in the Savior's love. It is safely moored, will the storm withstand, for it is well secured by the Savior's hand. And the cables pass from his heart to mine, can defy the strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold through the gathering night the city of gold, our harbor bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore with the storms all past forevermore. We Steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Did you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this beautiful day that you bless us with. We thank you for this opportunity we have, this midweek service to come together to study from your word and to worship you. Heavenly Father, we just ask you to continue to watch over the, uh, and bless the church here in New Philadelphia. We thank you for our elders and the leadership that they provide here. Uh, we pray for uh, our deacons, and we ask that you would continue to be with um, each and every one of them and their families. We pray for all of our families of the, the church here. We pray that we would always be a church that um, strives to be a light to this community. Heavenly Father, we have many on our sick list. We pray that you would be with them. We especially uh, pray for uh, Dick McCoy and his family. We pray that you would uh, comfort them, be with them as only you can at this time. Heavenly Father, we pray for our sister Tina Shaw. We pray that you continue to watch over her. We, we know she's improving, but pray that um, she would continue to do so. We pray for our sister, sister Linda Dawson. I pray that you would continue to be with her as she continues to rehab, um, and pray that she would continue improving as well. We pray for uh, Bonnie Stimble's father, Robert Whaley. Continue prayers for, for him and that family. We also have any father ask that you would uh, continue to, to watch over and bless uh, Ron and Janet as they are uh, struggling with their health at this time. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are struggling spiritually, those that are not Christians that, that need to turn their lives to you. Um, we pray for those that, that are our brothers and sisters in Christ that are struggling. We pray that uh, we can help them in any way that we can, but uh, ultimately they would uh, cast their cares upon you. 
Heavenly Father, just ask that you would be with us as we um, continue through this life. Pray that we would look to you and your Son and your Word for guidance. We are so thankful that we have uh, Jesus as our example and that he was so willing to come to this earth and suffer and die upon that cross for our sins. Heavenly Father, just be with us throughout the rest of the service and throughout the rest of this week. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'll turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy, I'm going to read a few verses there in chapter 6 in just a moment. Before I do that, I wanted to uh, tell you this story. On the way to drop off her daughter at preschool, a doctor left her a stethoscope on the car seat and left her daughter there just for a moment. It was uh, shortly after that she had done this that her daughter picked it up and began to play with it. And in her mind, the mother thought, oh, how wonderful, how sweet that my daughter is going to be a doctor just like me. But then the child spoke into the instrument. Welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? <laughs> now, it's an innocent story, but what it reminds me of and what it made me think about was how innocent, how pure a child's thoughts are. That a child doesn't process the things that adults process. They don't think about the things that we think about. Their thoughts are usually more about, you know, what can I do to have fun right now? But for us, it's a little more serious. And I think that to an extent, when Jesus said that unless we become like little children, uh, this, you know, there's an application there for us to think less about the, uh, the worrisome things, the ang anxious things like Seth was talking about on Sunday. But something else, too, a very important lesson that we're going to take from Deuteronomy chapter 6 is that if we, essentially, that if we want our children to grow up like we think they should, it, it really involves how we raise them. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we find in verses 4 through 9, a very important uh, statement. And I know that this was about 4,000, well, about 2,000 B.C., uh, that this law was given. Uh, these are the words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When I was growing up, and I've, I've told you this before, when I was adopted, uh, our first, my first meeting with my dad, I ran up to him and I said, are you a preacher? And he said, yes, are you Jesse? And I said, no, Jesse's my brother's name. But it was like something clicked with me that day when I ran up there that I want to be just like him. I want to be a preacher. There was a short while where I thought I was going to be a firefighter, but I knew I was going to be too chicken for that. And then I thought I was going to be, you know, a, a, a computer whiz because computers were, you know, a big thing. I remember these really cool computers we had at school, and I thought maybe I'll do something with that. And for a short while, I even thought I'd be a police officer, but I think I'd gained weight at that point, so I realized I'd fail the physical and gave that hope up. So I became a preacher. Now, I say that, I, seriously, I chose to be a preacher. It wasn't like it just, you know, it was the only thing I could do. Uh, but a lot of it had to do with how I was raised. You know, my dad was a preacher, so there was a lot of emphasis on that in raising his oldest son to do the same. Uh, I had a lot of influences, and so, you know, as I grew up, I mean, that's, I went to gospel meetings, we went to sings all the time, you know, we went to the lectureships at the preaching school, these things, that was the influence I had. And I'm not in this lesson suggesting that that has to be the way it is, but the key is, is that you fill your child's life with the things that are most needed. You know, it doesn't matter, and you have to think about it like this, what matters really is not what significant promotion they could gain in life, but how close they are to Christ. Because it doesn't really matter uh, who they want to be, but who they become in Him. Because in the end, we're all, we're all going to stand before the God of creation for the judgment day, no matter how old we are, no matter if we have children or not have any children. But if we seriously want what is best for them, we want them to grow up into the best thing that they can be, not necessarily what we want them to be, but the best thing, you know, the proverb says, raise a child in the way he should go, the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. We need to think about that. But most importantly, 
Your children's success should be important to you. Trophies and, and challenges that are met and goals that they can achieve, but their relationship with Christ, their relationship with their Father in Heaven is most important. And we need to remember that. Now, I can't stop thinking about it as a father, even if Rosemary is that young and she doesn't listen to anything I say, that I know that one day she will. And either I can feed her the information that she needs so that she will be a godly woman, or I can ignore that. I think a lot of parents, especially in my generation and the one directly before mine, you know, they got a little more lenient with their kids because they didn't like the, how strict things were you know, when they were kids. And, and generations go by, and, and eventually there's no God in the house. So we don't want to become like that. We don't want our children to become like that. Think about all the influences on the world or in the world when they go to school, when you guys are out in public, when you're at the playground, if they're hanging out with their friends, all of those influences, and then there's you. Think about the job that we have as parents, that you have as parents. And of course, you want your children to have fun, you want them to grow up, and you don't want them to regret being children, that they never had a childhood, but you never want them to be without Christ. That, that's the hardest thing. You read what the Proverbs have to say about a faithful son, a diligent son, and the good it does his parents. We need to remember those things. Take what Deuteronomy says, verses 6 through 9, because if we make it a regular part of our lives, if we make it a regular part of our children's lives, you know, when I was growing up, it's like, okay, really, another gospel meeting? But as I got older, I realized how important they were. And now, especially with the limited time, I don't go to them in, in the distance. And there aren't as many as there used to be. All of these factors, you know, I, I really miss them. So don't, be that, don't let that be you when you're older and thinking about your life and what it was and how your kids could have turned out. You know, it's not always in your power because once they leave the house, you know, they'll do what they want. But prepare them for that day. Prepare them for every day encounters that they have with the world. There's nothing better that you can do for them. And I know I haven't been a dad that long, but I know that for sure. That's what the Bible teaches me. Tonight, I want to encourage you in that way. Uh, nothing more. But I do want to say for you tonight, if you're here and you're not a Christian, there's an invitation within scriptures that has caused many of us to respond in such a positive way. Because Jesus said, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The greatest labor, the greatest burden that we carry is sin. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, that doesn't have to be. He will wash our sin away. He has done so if we give our lives to him, if we repent of our sins, if we confess his faith and we're baptized for the remission of our sins. All of that goes away. And, you know, there may be somebody here tonight who needs to make that decision to become a Christian. It may and likely will have a positive influence on your family. And if you're here tonight as a Christian, it may be that there's sin in your life. It may be a personal thing. That is a personal thing. You need to pray to God. Confess that fault, and he will forgive you. But if you need the prayers of the congregation, let us know. Please come as we stand and sing. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way.
closing song this evening will be I Stand in Awe. One verse to the song and following the song we'll have a closing prayer and be dismissed. You are beautiful beyond description to marvelous for words to wonderful for comprehension like nothing ever seen or heard who can grasp your infinite wisdom who can fathom the depth of your love you are beautiful beyond description majesty enthroned And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Please bow with me in prayer to our God, our Heavenly Father, before we depart. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this place where we can come together to learn more about your word. We thank you for the teachers who uh, put so much time into putting together their uh, lessons, into digging into your word, into helping to translate that to us and uh, so that we can use that information to grow closer to you and to help others know that you are there and uh, yeah, welcoming them uh, to heaven as well. We ask you to be with those who were uh, affected recently by the, the storms. And, uh, we ask you to uh, help them to regain some normalcy in, in their lives. We ask you to be with those uh, here in our of our number who are physically ill, that uh, you may bring comfort to them and they may uh, lean on you uh, for that comfort and um, to uh, look to you and your uh, guidance in, in, in their lives as well. We ask you to be with uh, our country and the leaders uh, therein that we may be able to uh, grow again closer to you and the way this uh, the country was founded in your way and under your wing. Help us to elect proper leaders and uh, for them to uh, respect your way and your word and um, pass that on to uh, the, what they uh, do in, in their leadership. We ask you to help us to remain and to remember to act and think in the innocence of uh, children and uh, to keep our lives from being uh, so complicated that uh, we don't have time for your word and your way. Help us to also look at the little children to um, as those who are needing uh, direction and to help lead them in your direction to uh, pass on the wisdoms that we have learned in this world and to show them to, uh, in your word, uh, your wisdoms that they can use uh, here on this life and into uh, heaven and growing into a, a Christian that will lead them to uh, serve you in heaven for eternity. Please help, help us to bring them up to know you, to become and remain close to Christ and to be uh, biblically biblically minded and uh, well founded in uh, your word so that they can be confident uh, in this life to uh, go out and uh, lead others in your way. We ask you to continue to be with us, keep us uh, safe and healthy and um, close.
close to you uh, throughout the rest of this week and until we meet again. It's through Jesus that we offer this prayer. Amen. All right, you? Not too bad. Staying cool.